Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me. And today I'll be focused on vaccine vasculitis. Now, I've been focused on autoimmunity since early 2020. And I've always said that severe COVID-19 is a viral mediated autoimmune disease. That means a cytokine storm is simply because the body has recognized a specific protein as foreign and the immune system attacks it. So I've always said that the problem was never to do specifically with the virus attacking the body, but the virus triggering an attack on the immune system. And that's why very early on in the pandemic, I always stated that we have to be very cautious with how we stimulate the immune system. I'll say nothing else on that topic at the moment, lest I end up being censored. But let's focus on what we are talking about today. And so I'll be going through a few simple points. And you have here first this paper that has recently been published about uh, new onset rheumatic immune inflammatory diseases um, following a vaccination. And I'll be going back to one of my older papers. This is the onset of autoantibodies in healthcare workers after vaccination. And I'll be highlighting the problem of being easily a year ahead because I said this easily in, in the 15th of August, 2022, about this autoimmune explosion. And so I'll be covering those areas uh, quite shortly. And uh, just before I start, I'd like to remind anyone who may be interested that the link for how to prepare for the next wave of COVID is right below. And we really appreciate the support for all those who want the information and support us um, because there's a coupon there. So if you are interested, please um, click on the link below in the description. So let's get back to this point. What else could we find if we actually looked for it? And that has always been my concern, is that everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people were saying that there are no problems. But I have been arguing that you can't find problems if you don't look for it. And so the fact that you don't know is not the same as there are no issues. Well, let's get into what exactly I'm talking about here. So this is a paper that was recently published, and it is New Onset Rheumatic Immune Mediated Inflammatory Diseases Following SARS-CoV-2 Vaccinations Until May 2023, a systematic review. This was a UK-based study, and you can see here Southport, Liverpool. There was somebody from India as well, but most of it is London, Southport, Wolverhampton, as well, there is somebody from Italy uh, in the team. And they were looking at a number of cases of a, what they did, a systematic review. That means they went through all of the published reports looking at immune-mediated inflammatory diseases following COVID-19 vaccination. Now, what they said here, critically, is that they knew that this kind of information following COVID-19 vaccination is lacking. So this is the point I'm making. Nobody was looking for it. So how can you know if there's a problem or can you reassure the public there is no problem if you haven't looked? So there was no real research into this beforehand. They were looking at a total of 271 cases from 39 countries between January 2021 and May 2023. Now, just to be clear, what you're going to find is that a lot of people will say, well, you know, we've given out two um, billions of doses, over 13 billions of um, doses. If they only have 271 cases, that's no big deal. Well, the reality is 271 cases that have been published. We have no idea what the real numbers would be like. And that's the point. More importantly, you don't ignore it. You ask the question, well, what could be the mechanism and how could something like this occur? And this fits in to what I had published easily. This was in, um, in August 2020. This here is this paper or this po um, Substack post, mRNA vaccines may trigger autoimmunity in up to 20% of recipients. I didn't say 200 recipients. 
20% of 13 billion, well, not 13 billion doses, but over almost 5, million, uh, 5 billion people. And this was based on a paper that was being done as a poster item. I came across it. I reached out to Maria Sacchi in Italy and I said, can I have a coffee, copy of that paper? She couldn't give me, but she gave me the front page of it, which just gave the summary of the abstract of it. And I highlighted this in August of 2022. They have now gone on to do a more detailed paper, which I will show in a little bit. But let's get back to the question in hand. When we look carefully at uh, what they had found in these cases, um, they had found that uh, in 271 uh, cases that were published, they found that there was a degree of vasculitis. Now, let's just clarify a bit about what exactly is a vasculitis. I've got here a simple explanation. It's inflammation and damage to blood vessels targeted by the immune system. So it's a bit more of a simplistic explanation. The point I'm making is that in an autoimmune vasculitis, it's usually the immune system that is targeting the blood vessels, okay? Now, this is an image of one type of vasculitis. It's what we call ANCA, or anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody associated vasculitis. And in this kind of vasculitis, it's not that common, but we do always look for it in patients who may have a vasculitis. In this case, this here is a plasma cell producing antibodies, and these antibodies target neutrophils that have been activated. Then once these neutrophils are targeted, they then create these nets, which then damage the blood vessel. And that's essentially what would happen in this type of vasculitis. Now, you have different kinds of vasculitis where the antibody may target specifically a protein on the surface of the blood vessel, or it could be related to something else. The point being, the most important point to remember in a vasculitis is that it damages the lining, leads to inflammation in the, in the, in the blood vessel. That's a very important point because... To understand why it's so important is your blood vessels or inside. If you imagine going inside the bloodstream, it is like it's as smooth as glass. And this is an image here. So this is what I'm trying to capture. So this is inside a blood vessel. You're seeing all these red blood cells here. I hope you're getting the point. But the lining, the wall is smooth absolutely smooth. And the reason that's so important is any kind of damage to this wall will immediately lead to a clot. And this is what that could look like. So this is me showing a damage of a perfect, uh, a smooth blood vessel. And then if you imagine that little area under there had been damaged, immediately to close that off, this blood vessel will have a clot in it. And this clot would then seal it and then it would heal it and bring it back to being smooth. In the context of a vasculitis, this clot, instead of just being able to, to close off the area of damage, continues to grow and eventually blocks the blood vessel. And that then causes other problems where you have blockage to blood vessels leading to an issue around blood flow to a particular tissue. And this can happen in many different organs. So in the context of COVID-19, I've always described severe COVID-19 as a lung vasculitis. And it's the damage to the lining of the blood vessels in the lung by the immune system with the virus that then causes microthrombi. And these then block the blood vessels in the lung and people can't breathe and then people die. So that has always been the perspective of severe COVID-19 from our research. This is why we described it as an autoimmune response rather than purely a viral response or a viral damage to these blood vessels. But the point is, therefore, why would a vasculitis occur in the context of this vaccine, the spike-based vaccine? And again, it's based on the fact that from our research, we had said that that spike protein on the virus would bind to a number of other proteins and could potentially 
cause the immune system to make a mistake and target a normal protein in the body as being part of the spike protein. This has always been the question, what they call mimicry, where uh, the immune system accidentally targets a normal protein, assuming it's a part of the virus. This could also happen with any source of spike protein. And this is why there could be a risk around the vaccine. This was always a question, but the scientific community overlooked this, I think, overlooked this autoimmune response. And I think it's only now starting to get to the fore, three years after this was predicted and highlighted. So let's get back to the paper. We can see here that this is the full screen of the demographics where the patients were, Japan, India, Turkey, China, South Korea, and they then detailed all the different vaccines that were used. So this is across the board. And this is why I said that this is not an mRNA issue per se. This is a spike protein issue. It can happen with the infection and it can happen with any source of the spike protein. Really important to try and see if we can understand the difference. And this is why it is such a critical point for us to be able to understand. When you look at the, um, the particular vaccines that had the highest rates, so the vaccination characteristics of patients, um, they found that the Pfizer-BioNTech was 56.5%, mainly 153 out of the 271 cases. The point being is that Pfizer was the most used vaccine. So it's not necessarily meaning that this has the highest risk. Oxford AstraZeneca is 22% higher than Moderna. And so probably based on the vaccines that were used and the volumes or the numbers, this one could have been the highest risk for this kind of vasculitis that would need to be broken down into bits. And then you can go right down the line to all the various other ones, uh, Sinopharm, uh, Covaxin, and it, it's sometimes about who is publishing the papers. So it's not, again, necessarily that this is only a reflection of which vaccines were targeted. My point is that in reality, it highlights that all the vaccines that were based around spike proteins seem to have that risk. Again, going back to the conclusion or the discussion in this paper, this here, this uh, systematic review explored the development uh, of new onset inflammatory diseases in adults after receiving COVID-19, COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations. This is a bit, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first systematic review to comprehensively investigate the emergence of these new conditions after vaccination. I mean, we are now in 2023, the end of 2023, Vaccination has been going on since er, mid, late 2020. And this is the first time we're looking in detail for this kind of thing. So there were publications, but no systematic review, no detailed study to try and understand why this could be occurring. Is that acceptable? If we find out that this is as high as been predicted by the Italians, 20% autoimmunity, goodness, who is responsible? How can that be acceptable that this was not identified very early? Why was it not a consideration? Why was it not thought of? That's really a big part of the question. So they went on here to the conclusions of the paper. So they clearly says they, it suggests that these rheumatic uh, inflammatory diseases may develop after administering COVID-19 vaccines to adults. The onset of symptoms after taking it is short. I think it's about 11 days they found on average, with many patients developing acute clinical symptoms. Only two patients died out of that cohort. And most of them were treated primarily with steroids. And the conclusion, although many cases are being reported across different parts of the world, 
they are still rare, short-lived, and respond to steroid and immunosuppressive agents. So in effect, they are concluding that it's interesting, but it's not a major issue. It's very rare. It's short-lived. Don't worry too much about it. I, I think that is not necessarily the uh, right approach. I think you have to say, we don't know how significant it is. We need to look further and see whether or not we could be missing very important aspects. When you compare this to what the Italians did, and so they were looking for autoantibodies in healthcare workers after mRNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. This one, they specifically looked only at Pfizer. And they had a small group of about 108 who had received vaccines, the third dose, and were considered for analysis. They then went looking at T0, time zero, uh, time one at three months, and time two at 12 months. And what they found that when they looked in that cohort, small cohort, they found the induction of autoantibodies in 28.57 of these subjects. Let me repeat that, 28.57. If you then extrapolate that over a full population, that is an absolute nightmare. Now, remember, they were only looking for autoantibodies and they found 28.57% number, I didn't say an increase, number of that small group ended up with autoantibodies that didn't have it before. And they found that those who had autoantibodies before had an increased level. That is the nidus of autoimmunity, the autoimmune vasculitis that can then present five years, 10 years down the line. Who is going to then make the connection? If we don't make this connection now, I don't think it will ever be found. The problem is, is there is no incentive to find this connection. The sad part about all of this is without any understanding of what is happening, there is little opportunity for mitigation. That's the bit that is going to hurt the most 10 years down the line. If this turns out to be very significant, where even 2% of the population, forget 20%, even 2% would be a huge disaster across for health for people across the world. Well, that's the lesson for today. And I look forward to sharing with you more ideas to keep you updated and continue to explain things under the paradigm and umbrella of COVID-19 autoimmunity. Have a great evening.